Kanye Center for Healthy Aging here in the School of Nursing, and I'm also Associate Director for the Northwest Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Center, what we affectionately known as the, know as the Northwest GWEC. And um, today we are in the fourth week of our lecture series. We're very excited to have this um, lecture from Dr. Zachary Markham. Before I get started on that, I did want to remind you that these video lectures are posted on our website. The address for that is nwgwec.org. If you go to online lectures, um, you'll be able to see the lecture posted within about 24 hours of um, when it's delivered here. And um, the handout for the PowerPoints is also posted there. Um, in addition, there's about uh, 65 to 70 other lectures from past geriatric lecture series um, on just about any topic you can think of. And if you can think of other topics, please put that on your evaluation sheet. Um, today, Dr. Zachary Markham is going to talk to us about medication and falls. He completed his PhD program in clinical and translational science at the University of Pittsburgh's Institute for Clinical Research Education. He also holds a PharmD from Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, he conducts clinical research in the areas of pharmacoepidemiology and health services interventions to measure and improve medication adherence and drug-related problems such as falls for older adults, thus his expertise for this topic. And welcome, Dr. Markham. Thank you, Barb. Mm -hmm. And thank you to everyone out there. Um, so it's truly an honor to be talking about this topic today because it's a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, it was actually the topic that I chose to do for my PhD dissertation. And I'm currently working on a grant that I'll talk about a little bit later um, that's due in about two weeks that is on this very topic. So I've been thinking about it um, over the past few years, um, but in particular over the past few weeks as we get this grant together. Let's see. Let me... Get my, my view here is just of me. <laughs> Could we um, see the PowerPoint slides, please? Why don't you go for that? Okay. So if I hit next, it'll go. Oops. Let's go back. Yep. Okay. Great. Here we go. Um, so obviously we're going to be talking about medications and falls today. And anytime we're talking about falls in general, whether it relates to medications or not, um, I think the take-home message is that we're always talking about a trade-off. There's always a risk and a benefit involved, and it's always that fine balance. Um, that, we're, that we need to be thinking about. Um, so keep in mind the word trade-off. Um, we know that um, the strongest risk factors for falling are either a history of previous falls, um, having gait, balance, or strength problems, and medications. So in the literature, those are the three strongest risk factors. So also keep in mind that medications are just one risk factor that we're talking about. So we're going to take a deep dive into medications, but please don't lose sight of the larger context that is um, fall prevention, which is certainly multifactorial. <clears throat> so the objectives for today, um, first we're going to talk about the factors that increase the risk of medication-related falls in older adults. Then we're going to dive into the medications and classes themselves and really look at the, the evidence. What is the literature behind um, these, these medications? And then finally, we'll talk about ways to improve medication-related falls, and also talk about some um, current research that is being proposed. So as a brief background, um, and this is also drawing off of Dr. Phelan's lecture a couple weeks ago on falls in older adults, we know that more than one-third of community-dwelling elders fall each year. This is a staggering statistic. There we go. Um, when you think about it, um, that one in three older adults each year living in the community, so you would think they're relatively healthy, will fall. The reason we care about falls in older adults is that a small but sizable proportion of them 
can lead to really bad outcomes, things like fractures, traumatic brain injuries, and soft tissue injuries. In addition, in geriatrics, function is everything. That's always our goal, is to um, maximize function in the older adult. And we know that falls are a major contributor to functional decline and also healthcare utilization, which really drives um, up healthcare cost. I mean, falling in the United States each year costs billions and billions of dollars. Another concept to keep in mind is that falling is a geriatric syndrome. And basically, that means that there are multiple contributing factors. So if you've heard the term geriatric syndrome before, you know that it basically means that you have an older adult who has chronic kind of underlying impairments or conditions that are then exacerbated by an acute precipitating event. Um, other geriatric syndromes include things like urinary incontinence and delirium, for example. So in the context of falling, say you have an older adult who um, is kind of physically declining. So you have that baseline chronic impairment and then you have a new medication that's added on top of that that could potentially lead to a fall. Um, but it's only on top of that chronic underlying impairment that it really becomes a problem. There are many resources available for fall prevention, um, and this is just one of them that I wanted to point out. If you are at all interested in hosting your own local sort of outreach initiative, um, I would recommend you go to the National Council on Aging website, which is listed here at the bottom. Um, ironically, Fall Prevention Awareness Day is held each year on the first day of fall. And so this past fall, it was uh, September 23rd. So keep your eyes peeled um, for this upcoming September. The National Council on Aging um, puts out a lot of different educational materials. This is one that I really like. Um, and it's the six steps to prevent a fall. And the statistic up top is very, very alarming, I think. So every 15 seconds, an older adult is in an emergency department for a fall-related injury. So since I've started speaking, um, say that's been 10 minutes, there are 40 older adults who have experienced a fall-related injury for which they're seeking care. Just unbelievable. Um, so you can see here the six steps. And again, medication review and medication reduction is one of these components. It's not everything, but it is a really important one, which is why um, we're addressing it today. Just to reiterate some of the other fall prevention strategies, finding a good balance and exercise program, talking with your health care provider about your fall risk, um, getting your vision and hearing checked annually, keeping your home safe, and then also engaging your family members to really make it um, a team effort. So when we talk about risk factors for falls, one way to stratify them is either intrinsic to the patient or extrinsic to the patient. So intrinsic, meaning within the patient, could be something like leg weakness, versus extrinsic, which is something that is kind of in their external environment, like maybe a throw rug or poor lighting. Another way to stratify risk factors for falls is to look at modifiable and non-modifiable. And of course, modifiable is where we want to pay attention, because those are the things we can actually impact. And medications are some of the most readily modifiable risk factors for falls. An example of a non-modifiable risk factor in the literature has been shown um, to be female sex. Of course, you know, there's nothing that we can really do from a clinical standpoint um, for the non-modifiable risk factors. We also know that the total number of risk factors increases the risk. And so fall prevention is all about risk reduction. We're never um, potentially going to get to zero risk factors, but we can certainly make an impact in a patient that has six and knock it down to three, for example. So that really does make a difference. So now focusing on risk factors for medication-related falls. I'm sure you've heard the term polypharmacy. Um, so what is polypharmacy? Well, it depends on where you're at. It means different things in different circles. So if you're in the nursing home setting, um, based on CMS regulations, polypharmacy would mean nine or more medications. In the outpatient setting, typically it's four or five and above, um, but it just depends. And then other folks define it as more medications than are indicated for that patient. So that gets at the idea of appropriateness, which I tend to like, rather than using just a, a strict cutoff or a number. Um, and we know that simply the number of medications um, is a risk factor for falling in older adults. So the more medications someone's on, 
the more likely they are to be on a medication that can increase their risk. The second risk factor is drug disease interactions. So when we think about drug interactions, typically you think of two drugs interacting with each other. But what this is, is an older adult who has a health condition, say, like heart failure, and they take a drug that can exacerbate that underlying condition. So something like an NSAID for pain that can exacerbate their heart failure. So that interaction is what we call a drug disease interaction. In patients that have a history of falling or fracturing, there are medications and medication classes that we certainly want to avoid because a drug disease interaction um, can manifest. And we'll talk in more detail about that in a few minutes. The third risk factor is a recent start of a medication. So that's typically the riskiest time when you're starting a medication. Um, sometimes the initial dose can be too high or the titration can be too fast, or the drug can completely be inappropriate and it should have never been started, and simply the presence of that drug can lead to a fall. And then finally, when we stop drugs, either intentionally or unintentionally, um, an adverse drug withdrawal event can happen. And that can either be a physiologic withdrawal reaction from certain medications, um, or it can be an exacerbation of the underlying condition. So now that the drug is not there, the underlying condition that was being treated flares up. So for example, um, say someone is using an analgesic for pain and for whatever reason it stopped, their pain flares up. Pain itself is a risk factor for falling um, because the, the older adult will not be as functional. So the starting and stopping of medications can be risky periods of time. So now we're going to spend most of our time looking at the different medications that we're talking about that are implicated for causing falls. So we're going to review the current state of the literature on meds and falls. Um, as you know, if you've read any literature on this topic, falls are extensively studied in older adults. It's a very broad body of literature. And in fact, drugs are commonly assessed in this body of literature, but unfortunately, measuring and assessing medications in research studies is oftentimes tricky, and we'll talk about some reasons why. So there's a lot of room for improvement to look at medications in falls. So some of the current gaps include the fact that there's limited ability to look at a dose-response relationship, and that simply means that our people who are on higher doses at higher risk. Also duration response. A lot of these medications that we're going to be talking about are chronic therapies, and so um, a lot of the studies are limited in their duration. Um, and we really want to know what is the risk over the lifetime use of that drug. And that's really hard to come by in existing research. You may not have heard of confounding by indication, but it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about as a pharmacoepidemiologist. Um, so what is confounding by indication? Um, in observational studies, which is basically all of the literature on this topic because you would never do a clinical trial where you have some people get a drug and some people don't and you watch who falls. That's unethical. Um, so all of our research is on observational data. And so that's why this is an issue because simply being indicated for a drug, like an antihypertensive, means that that patient might have a different underlying risk profile than somebody that's not receiving the drug or is not indicated. And those differences in risk profiles could impact differences in the outcomes that you're looking at, like falls. And so we pay attention to this and adjust for it by using different um, study designs and different statistical approaches. But this has been a big limitation um, of existing literature to date. Also, the risk of exposure longitudinally, which I mentioned, and then over-the-counter medication use. In the United States, uh, OTC meds and herbal supplements and vitamins are not treated the same way as prescription medications. Um, and what I mean by that is that they're not regulated to nearly the same extent. And when someone purchases them, there's not a prescription claim that's generated. And so when someone like myself who wants to do research on this topic wants to look at it, there's not really a good database to look at because that information is simply not there. It was just a transaction at the local pharmacy on the cash register, not sent to a third party insurer where we can actually capture it. So OTC medication use is oftentimes missed in research studies. And depending on the medication class, it can have really important implications. 
So you've likely heard of the Beers criteria um, for older adults. If you've not, I'll just give you a brief background. Um, so they are named after um, a geriatrician named Mark Beers, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. And he was a pioneer um, of his time. He created these criteria for the first time in 1991 as his geriatric fellowship project. Um, and basically, he came up with a list of medications that should generally be avoided in older adults. And he started in the nursing home setting. And again, that was in 1991. Um, they were updated in 1997 to expand to, the, to all older adults, not just those in the nursing home. So ambulatory, everybody. Um, then they were updated in 2003. Um, that was kind of the era of Medicare Part D. And so these criteria started to be incorporated into different quality measures. If you've heard of NCQA or the HEDIS measures. So um, plans, health plans were being measured based on their prevalence of use of some of these medications that were included in the criteria. So everybody really started paying attention to them once they started being held accountable for them. Then in 2012, the American Geriatric Society assumed ownership of the criteria, and they really gave a lot of um, strength to them by doing systematic reviews, um, and they also put a lot of effort into making educational um, materials for the Beers criteria. And then they were most recently updated in 2015, so just last year, and we'll talk about um, what the update included. So that's a brief background. Um, the approach of the Beers criteria is to identify drugs to avoid in older adults, either independent of diagnosis. So no matter what you have, you should pretty much avoid this medication. Um, and we call those drugs to avoid. Um, and then also considering diagnosis. And that is what I mentioned before, the drug disease interaction. The goal, the goal of the Beers criteria is to reduce adverse drug events and drug-related problems and simply improve safe medication use. And now, like I mentioned, they're designed for every clinical setting. And there's a lot of educational um, potential for them. They're also, they continue to be used in quality measures. Um, and people like myself use them in research arenas. <clears throat> so let's look at the Beers criteria <clears throat> drug disease interaction for older adults that have a history of falls or fractures. These are the medication classes that are implicated. So you can see here we have anticonvulsants, antipsychotics, benzos, non-benzos, and those are drugs like Zolpidem or Ambien for sleep. Sometimes we call those the Z drugs. Um, tricyclic antidepressants, SSRIs for depression, things like um, sertraline or Zoloft or citalopram or Celexa. Um, acetalopram, um, Lexapro, and then in 2015, opioids were added to the criteria. So again, these are drugs that we typically want to avoid or really minimize their dosing um, in older adults that have fallen or fractured. So what is the reason? The Beers criteria now, um, they provide a rationale and even a recommendation, which is a great addition. Um, the reason is that they can cause ataxia, impaired function, syncope, and simply put, they can cause the older adult to fall again. Um, an important note is that in the past, not all benzos were, were listed, but now they say that even the short-acting ones like Xanax or Alprazolam and the long-acting ones like clonazepam, all of them are risky. So it kind of makes it easier to remember. Um, and this is kind of the take-home message. If one of these drugs is to be used, you should consider reducing the dose of other central nervous system acting medications that increase the risk of falls and fractures. And always, always keep in mind to um, consider non-pharmacologic interventions for fall reduction. So it's kind of a, a multifaceted approach. So the, the AGS, the American Geriatric Society, says you should avoid these agents unless safer alternatives are not available. So they're not 100%, it's not black and white. These are certainly, they have a lot of gray. Um, for example, they provide caveats. So for the anticonvulsants, you should avoid unless the patient has seizure or mood disorders, where it's 100% indicated. For opioids, um, we should really minimize their use except for pain management due to recent fractures or joint replacement. 
um, you're seeing a lot of um, policy initiatives and a lot of um, push to try to reduce opioid use now in older adults. Um, and so this just kind of further adds to that movement. So when you look at these, um, hopefully something that stands out is that all of these are central nervous system medications. So they're working on the brain. Um, and so you can imagine how they can potentially cause falls, right? They could lead to sedation, confusion, um, decreased function, and the like. So CNS medications, um, anytime you see one of these, it should be a red flag in your head to think, hey, you know, is the patient indicated for this? If not, could we consider a dose reduction or a discontinuation or a switch or a non-farm intervention? So just keep that in mind. So now let's um, work through some of the individual medication classes. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to point out this study here that looked at the association between CNS medications, which we just talked about. And in this study, they looked at benzos, opioids, antipsychotics, and antidepressants. So they looked at the association between all of those medication classes with the outcome of recurrent falls in older adults. And the setting for this study was a prospective cohort study of older adults in Pittsburgh and Memphis. And I'll give more details on this study um, in a couple slides. This is called the Health, Aging, and Body Composition Study, or Health ABC. And so they adjusted for all the things that you would think of adjusting for in a cohort study. Um, and you can see here the different doses at the bottom. Um, so less than one is technically low dose. Um, one to three is moderate dosage. And more than three you could call high dose. And what the investigators did here is they kind of standardized the dosing of of all these four medication classes. So for each patient, say they were on an antidepressant and an antipsychotic, they standardized that medication exposure and summed it to create kind of the, the patient level exposure to one of these CNS medications. So that's where these figures come from. Um, so for less than one, you see the confidence interval includes one, so it's not statistically significant. But for the other two, you can see a nice dose response relationship. So this study simply showed that higher total daily doses of CNN, CNS medications were associated with recurrent falls, which um, this study was actually included in the evidence used for the Beers criteria. So now let's focus on a specific medication class. So antidepressants. Um, as a brief background, we know that the prevalence of mild depressive symptoms is small but sizable. It's about 15% in community populations. In institutional settings, like in long-term care, it's much higher. And the real conundrum here is that both depressive symptoms and antidepressants have been shown to increase the risk of falls. So it's really difficult to disentangle which one is it and in an individual patient, which is their biggest risk factor. Because you certainly don't want to undertreat depression, but you don't want to unnecessarily expose them to an antidepressant that might cause them to fall. So again, we talked about the Beers criteria, drug disease interaction. And so the antidepressant classes here are the SSRIs and the TCAs. So this was one of the um, papers that I did for my dissertation. And I used the data set um, that I mentioned, the Health, AG, Health ABC study. Um, this included a little bit more than 3,000 black and white men and women who were enrolled back in 97, 98, and they were between 70 and 79 at baseline. And they were community dwellers in Pittsburgh and Memphis, and these were well-functioning older adults. So they had to be able to walk at least a quarter of a mile or up um, a flight of stairs. And they were followed annually, annually from 1997, 98, and actually the study continues today. Um, it's shifted more into a palliative care focus. Um, but for the purposes of this analysis, I use data from years one through seven. So as with most cohort studies, there is a whole host of measurements that are taken. Um, so physiologic measurements like blood pressure, which is really key um, for some of our studies, and performance measurements. Um, they do a lot of questionnaires, so sociodemographics, physical health, like self-reported um, health conditions, and importantly, medication use. And in these types of studies, 
you're able to do um, a nice inventory of all the medications, including over-the-counter meds. So that was really nice. So what did we do? We looked at medication use in years 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6. 4, for some reason, they didn't collect meds. I'm not sure who made that decision, um, but we had to work around it. And then we looked at falls in the subsequent year. So we basically created five waves. So for year one medication use, we looked at year two falls. For year two medication use, we looked at year three falls. And that's what we call um, you know, establishing a temporal relationship. You want to make sure your exposure comes before your outcome. We controlled for all the things you could think of um, to address potential confounding by indication, which I mentioned earlier. So our independent variable was a dichotomous variable of any antidepressant drug use. Um, so that was simply yes or no. And then we looked at three subclasses. So we had the SSRIs, the TCAs, and other, which included things like um, bupropion um, or Wellbutrin um, and some other um, miscellaneous antidepressants. And we used a similar approach as the study I mentioned before, where we standardized the daily dose. So for example, an older adult taking 10 milligrams of citalopram um, we divided that by the minimum effective daily dose for that drug, which is 10 milligrams. So that patient would have been on a standardized daily dose of 1, so 10 divided by 10. If they were taking 20, it would be 20 divided by 10, which is 2. So that's just an easy way to standardize exposure across individual medications in a class. And for our outcome, we looked at recurrent falls in the past 12 months. Um, and you, would, you might ask yourself, is this reliable? Are people able to self-report falls? And in fact, they are. Um, there is evidence to suggest, um, as long as they're not cognitively impaired, um, which these folks, the vast majority of them were not, <clears throat> are able to report accurately. Um, and we looked at recurrent falls as opposed to single falls because we thought that might be a better indicator of, of bad things. I mean, it's very likely that someone could fall one time just by an accident. Um, for statistics, I won't spend much time on this, but we use generalized estimating equations, um, which is basically an extension of logistic regression, if you've heard of that. Um, and it controls for um, the fact that measurements across each year might be correlated, because some of these people are the same. We were interested in looking at those that had a history of falls or fractures at baseline, and so we stratified by that. So what did we find? We found that our primary... Um, predictor, our primary independent variable of any antidepressant use was statistically significantly associated with recurrent falls. So you can see here the adjusted odds ratio is 1.48 and the confidence interval um, does not include one. We also found short duration of use to be significantly associated with recurrent falls. And short duration of use was defined as less than two years. Um, and you could argue with that definition. That was simply what the, the study um, had used. And then our SDD of 1 to 2. And so as a reminder, that is the moderate dosage range. So it was less than 1, 1 to 2, and more than 2. So that was kind of the, the middle of the road. Um, and when you think about that, a lot of antidepressants are used for things other than depression. So for example, low-dose TCAs can be used sometimes for pain. And so um, this middle of the range dosing um, could reflect just standard treatment for depression. Of the subclasses, only the SSRI showed a significant association. So here you see an adjusted odds ratio of 1.62. Um, so you can say that patients taking SSRIs had a 62% increased likelihood of experiencing recurrent falls compared to those not using SSRIs. And then when we stratified by history of falls and fractures, this is consistent um, with the Beers criteria and with what some others have found. Um, this was, in fact, the highest point estimate. And by point estimate, I mean the, the odds ratio, 1.83, and it was significant. So in conclusion, <clears throat> we found that antidepressant use overall, SSRI use, and short duration of use, and moderate dosage were associated with recurrent falls and that the highest risk seemed to be in those people that had a history. So that kind of validated what we, um, what we had thought, um, and it also just kind of solidified the um, existing literature.
I would love to do more research using more recent data because, um, as you may be aware, the use of antidepressants has drastically shifted over the years. And the time frame for this study was back in 1997-98 into the early 2000s. Um, so now SSRIs are predominantly used for the treatment of depression. There's also SNRIs, the selective norepi, um, or serotonin norepi reuptake inhibitors. And there are also several new medications on the market. Um, and so I think we need um, some updated research on this topic. And also within the class, um, you know, because we need to use these drugs sometimes. So within the class, which ones are riskier or safer? So comparative effectiveness research. Um, I, I don't want to just simply wipe out an entire class and say it's too risky to use. Sometimes we need these agents. Um, so I think we need better comparative effectiveness research as well. So in addition to the Beers criteria drug disease interaction, there are also other medications of concern. And I'm sure you're aware of anticholinergics and all their bad side effects that we think about. Um, so anticholinergics is a huge class of medications. Um, it's probably the most common side effect that a medication can have is, is dry mouth, which is an anticholinergic side effect. Um, but some of the most common subclasses include the first-generation antihistamines, things like diphenhydramine or Benadryl. And unfortunately, this medication is in hundreds of over-the-counter products um, that are easily accessible, and oftentimes the ingredient is hidden um, because the, the product might have a name like Tylenol, PM, or something, and you might have no idea that, that the diphenhydramine is actually all that's in there. Um, so it's a little bit confusing for some consumers. Um, in addition, Parkinson's drugs, antispasmodics, things like hyoscyamine for various gastrointestinal disorders, and some of the skeletal muscle relaxants. So anticholinergics are potentially risky. So when we think about anticholinergics, it's important to know that reducing them is feasible. Otherwise, it would be pointless to, to really think about it. So we know that we can reduce them. And the reason we can reduce them is that there are oftentimes non-pharmacologic interventions and non-anticholinergic alternative meds that are available. So this is an example here. Um, so TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants, are notorious for being anticholinergic. And also paroxetine, or Paxil, which is an SSRI, um, it is the most anticholinergic among the class of SSRI antidepressants. So the non-farm alternative, of course, is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and the alternatives could be other SSRIs, other than paroxetine, or SNRIs that I mentioned, things like venlafaxine or Effexor. And so you might say, well, didn't you just tell me that SSRIs are associated with falls, and yes, and this gets back to the whole point of it being a trade-off. You know, sometimes you have to use these medications, and the, the goal is just to reduce the risk as much as possible. So you'd probably not want to ever pick paroxetine um, in an older adult who's at risk for falling because it is anticholinergic. But if they have depression that needs treated, there are other agents that are less anticholinergic. So that's the point here. When we look at the literature for anticholinergics and falls, um, you would think, well, surely it's been figured out by now. This class of medications has been around for decades. But interestingly, it is not really that strong of a body of literature. Um, so there's differences in how people have measured the outcomes, self-report versus claims, single versus multiple falls. Um, a lot of the studies in the US in particular lack over-the-counter medication use. Um, they've had an inability to adjust for important confounders. Cross-sectional, which if you remember from um, your stats classes or research design classes, it's an okay study design, but it's not the strongest. So there are stronger designs beyond cross-sectional. Um, and then these populations have been rather select, so maybe nursing home patients um, or other high-risk patients like inpatient um, patients. And often they've been non-US. Um, because other countries, like those in Europe, um, tend to capture over-the-counter products really well, um, given their system. And so they're able to do um, pretty robust epidemiologic work. So we sought out to try to address this question using data from the Women's Health Initiative. Um, and I worked with some folks here at the UW and also folks across the country. 
um, and this has been ongoing over the past year. Um, so the, the sample for this study is postmenopausal women, and that's simply um, the Women's Health Initiative. That's, that's who the enrollees were. Um, and they were aged 65 to 79. We had a very large sample, about 67,000. Similar to the other studies, we looked at recurrent falls in the past 12 months. Um, for this study, we did not have as many time points to assess, unfortunately. So we looked at baseline in year three, but we did have both prescription and over-the-counter. And over-the-counter is really important for the anticholinergics for the reason I mentioned earlier about Benadryl. And think about all the antihistamines that are available over-the-counter. Without that, it's really kind of hard um, to figure out what a study would tell you if it did not have over-the-counter um, exposure. So a very similar approach to our previous stuff. What did we find? So we found about 1 in 10 of these older women were using an anticholinergic med. For our main model, we found that any anticholinergic use was significantly associated with recurrent falls. So here the adjusted odds ratio is 1.51. And that goes up in those people who are using multiple anticholinergic use. So it's suggesting somewhat of a dose-response relationship. <clears throat> we looked at different subclasses. So things like anticholinergics used for vertigo, for nausea vomiting, um, for antihistamines, um, and antidepressants, antipsychotics is the only one I'm showing here, just because it had the highest um, point estimate at 1.81. But each of the subclasses was associated with falls. Um, so that, that was that study. Of course, there's limitations to, to any research study. Um, the exposure measurement of anticholinergics is kind of all over the board. There are about seven different ways to measure them, and what we decided to do is certainly different than what some others have done. Uh, we didn't have dose information. We were not able to look at the dynamic patterns of use. So you can imagine people use medications in very sporadic ways. Sometimes they'll start, stop, switch, and with these kind of snapshot assessments that we have at, at the annual visits, you miss some of that. Um, so that would be really interesting to look at. It's just really hard to find those data. Um, and then always a measure confounding. <clears throat> so we concluded that use of strong or moderate anticholinergic meds, because those were the only ones that we focused on, um, in older women was associated with a higher likelihood of multiple falls, especially in those taking multiple agents. So this speaks to the idea of, again, reducing exposure as much as possible. Um, you don't have to get to zero, but something is better than nothing. So now let's shift gears and look at the antihypertensives. So this was a big study that came out last year in JAMA Internal Medicine. And these investigators um, looked at the association between antihypertensive medications and serious fall injuries in um, older adults using data from the Medicare Current Beneficiary Survey. And they had about 5,000 community-dwelling elders um, and they were followed for three years. And these folks were um, above 70 years of age. So you can see here the conclusion is that antihypertensives were associated with serious fall injuries. And what does a serious fall injury mean in this study? So they included hip and other major fractures, traumatic brain injury, and dislocations. So these are pretty bad events. Um, and so this was a big, big deal. It, it got a lot of press. Um, and it's really telling the story of competing risk. So you, why do you take antihypertensives? To prevent negative cardiovascular outcomes, like heart attack and stroke and so on. But at the same time, you have this drug that potentially could lead to these other bad outcomes. So there's this competing risk um, that's at play here. And when this study was published, um, this is what happened. So you saw a lot of articles coming out questioning antihypertensive use. And this is important because antihypertensives are some of the most commonly used medications in older adults. And so this really caused a lot of um, controversy, um, dialogue, and it really um, kind of added to the mixed body of literature that's already there. Um, because really the risk is if you say, OK, well, here's um, my patient. They're on this antihypertensive. I'm going to stop them. Well, now you might be putting that patient at risk for a bad outcome um, in terms of cardiovascular risk. And so 
this study really created a lot more questions, I think. And so one of the papers <clears throat> that I did for my dissertation looked at antihypertensives using a very similar methodology to the antidepressants that I mentioned before. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, it's a common condition. Prior research has found an association, but it's been rather mixed. And at the time that I was doing this, um, little was known. Um, so this paper kind of beat me to the punch. So our independent variable was any antihypertensive use. We also looked at all the different subclasses, things like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, diuretics, and so on. And we used um, a very similar methodology. Because we had access to their blood pressure measurements at the visits, we were able to subset our analysis to those that had hypertension and then also stratified by controlled or uncontrolled. Because you could argue that if someone is controlled, they might be at less of a risk. Um, or depending on if they're overly controlled, they might be at a higher risk if their blood pressure is too low. So we wanted to see what happened when we stratified. We also looked at fall history, and we did propensity score adjustment, which is just a fancy way of trying to control for confounding by indication. So what did we find in our study? And again, this is health ABC data, the same participants that I mentioned for the antidepressant study. So these are community dwellers um, from Pittsburgh and Memphis. And you can see here that the confidence interval includes one. So this was not a statistically significant association. When we looked at the subclasses, only loop diuretics showed a significant association, which makes sense. Um, this, is, uh, this includes medications like furosemide or Lasix um, that can really cause some dizziness in the older adult. And trust me when I say we did sensitivity analysis um, to the cows came home, and they all led to the same finding. Um, so really, our main finding was that antihypertensive use in this population was not associated with recurrent falls. And again, the outcomes are different. So I'm here looking at self-reported recurrent falls. The, the other study was using Medicare claims. So these are two very different things. And they're looking at fall injuries. So you have to keep in mind what it is that your outcome is. Um, we found loops, loop diuretics, to be associated with falls. <clears throat> and this was published last year in the Journal of Gerontology. And then more recently, in um, the journal Hypertension, um, Lou Lipsitz from Boston looked at a cohort of older adults with hypertension and followed them monthly to do um, self-reported falls assessment. Um, for a year, and they also found that antihypertensives were not associated with an increased risk of falls. Um, and he emailed me with a copy of his article and said, you know, it's good to see that we found the same thing, basically. Um, so I would say that the story still remains to be told, um, but what are you to do right now in the meantime? Um, so I, as a researcher, am going to say that we need more research. Um, I think we need larger sample sizes and in different settings. Um, so what can you do? I think the key is screening for high-risk patients, and that includes people with a history of falling or fracturing, and also patients who are exhibiting signs and symptoms of hypotension, um, and that could include orthostatic hypotension. So I would um, highly advise taking the extra few minutes to check for orthostasis, um, and those are patients that you might want to take another look at in terms of maybe minimizing exposure to antihypertensives. But on the whole, um, do antihypertensives in general cause falls? I would say it's largely unknown right now. Um, so I think it, this comes down to patient-specific risk factors and patient-centered care. And I worry about the conflicting data um, when articles come out in big journals like JAMA that it could lead to the inappropriate undertreatment of hypertension um, in an effort to prevent falls. And so this is really the heart of geriatrics. Um, I feel like this story is told over and over again, um, the trade-off between risk and benefit. So other medications, hypoglycemics. You can imagine um, if you've ever had low blood sugar, how you feel, You're a little lightheaded, dizzy. Um, so the older adult who may have less underlying physiologic reserve, um, they're probably even more likely to have a fall from a hypoglycemic if it lowers their blood sugar too, too much. And there are many, many other medications, things like Parkinson's drugs, for example, 
Um, so basically, any medication, depending on its side effect profile, can cause a fall. So you just really need to, um, to screen your patient for their risk factors and monitor them closely. So now that we know which medications could be associated with falls, what should we do? So let's get back to the basics and talk about collecting a good medication history. Um, it sounds really easy, but it's probably one of the hardest things to do in our current healthcare system, and it's frequently um, wrought with error. So an accurate med history is critical, obviously, um, to, to really do a good falls risk assessment. Um, what do you want to be asking for? You want to be looking at prescriptions, OTCs, supplements, and herbal products. Um, I remember a patient um, when I was back in Pittsburgh who slowly revealed over time, over many visits, all his different supplements. Um, I think it came with maybe developing trust. He didn't want me to take them all away or recommend he stop them all. And each visit, he would come back with another bag of supplements. Um, and so I think you just need to you know, understand your patient's beliefs about their medications um, in order to, to really get the whole story. And then alcohol. Um, I remember a patient who reported um, taking their their Benadryl at night for sleep with their scotch. So that is, I mean, that's a really risky combination um, in an older adult who might have to get up to use the restroom in the middle of the night. Um, so never forget the, um, the question about alcohol and how it interacts with certain medications. So you want to record the medication name, the dose, the time taken each day, and if it's used as needed, you want to know how often are they using it. So using a Benadryl, you know, once every two weeks is much less risky than every night. And so that's important information to get. How do you get a good medication history? Um, I think this is kind of the art of medicine. You'll get better over time. Um, there's really no evidence to support one way over the other. Um, but really what we do know is that there are major discrepancies between what patients think they should be taking, what they're actually taking, and what we as healthcare providers think they're taking and especially then what is documented in the EHR. Um, and that speaks to the issue of medication reconciliation, which is a national initiative and has been for years by the Joint Commission and many other agencies um, to really get that right because it's so critical. Um, so a brown bag review is in many ways considered the gold standard for getting a medication history. And what that means is that you have the patient bring um, in a bag or whatever, all of their medications and herbals and OTC products, and you actually go through them one by one. Um, ideally, you would have the patient, you would hand it to them and you would say, how do you use this? What do you use it for? Are you having any side effects? Of course, that takes time. And in our ever um, stressful healthcare environment, it's becoming more and more challenging. Um, but I think this speaks to the idea of team medicine. And so it doesn't always have to be the um, main provider that's doing this. It could be someone else, like um, the nurse, the nurse practitioner, the pharmacist, um, whomever. So brown bag review is really um, the gold standard currently. <clears throat> so if you have a panel of patients, how could you prioritize who you want to pay attention to? Because maybe you don't have time to see everybody. So an easy way is to look at those taking more than four medications, and in some settings, that might not be helpful because it could be everyone. Um, you could also look at those people taking psychotropic medications or the CNS meds that we talked about. Are they taking meds that can cause orthostasis? Obviously antihypertensives, some of the TCAs, diuretics, for example. So really kind of training your brain to think when you see a medication, fall risk, fall risk, fall risk um, is, is pretty important. Also, when you're interviewing the patient and their family members or caregivers, if they mention any of these symptoms that could be an adverse drug event, that would be really important as well. Um, one of my former colleagues who's a geriatrician, he always said, any new symptom in an older adult, the first thing you should think of is a medication. So that, that should be the number one priority is, was there a new medication or is there an existing medication that could be causing this symptom? Because so often it is. So obviously, blurred vision, dizziness, sedation, anxiety, these could all be um, due to medications, and then the symptom could lead to the fall. So I just also wanted to point out um, kind of a paradigm shift in treating 
diabetes. So two large studies recently have shown no benefit from super tight control of diabetes. Um, and so you're seeing a lot of <clears throat> the A1C goals shifting. So before, you know, it was less than 6.5%, less than 7%, and now it's um, becoming much more relaxed, especially in the frail older adult. So these are folks in nursing homes. Um, you certainly would want to avoid short-acting agents at night to avoid um, severe hypoglycemia. A lot of times you can decrease the intensity of the, the finger sticks. Um, you can accept less tight control and really, really pay attention to people coming from hospitals. Um, because what is appropriate in the hospital may not be appropriate and could even be very risky in other settings, things like sliding scale insulin, which you know is, a, is an order set in the hospital. If that's in the nursing home, that, that's really risky. So now for the last part, um, I just wanted to talk about some ways that we can improve medication management um, as it relates to falls. So everything that we're working toward is really de-prescribing, right? We're identifying these meds that are high risk and we need to do something about that. And that is typically de-prescribing. Um, but unfortunately, little is known about how to de-prescribe. Um, when you think about how a drug is approved in the US, um, studies are done to show a certain di dosing titration that's effective. Um, and then that is in the package insert. But there's nothing in there about how to stop it. And so that evidence is, is really unknown. Um, it's the art of medicine. We know that some drugs, when they're stopped too quickly, can lead to bad um, outcomes. And also we know that some small studies have shown that reducing psychotropic meds can actually reduce falls. Um, but in the meantime, what can you do? What is a general rule of thumb? So one thing that I like to think of is you should take at least as long to stop a drug as you did to start it. So if you've taken, say, four weeks to start an SSRI for um, the treatment of depression, when you're stopping that medication, your, your framework should be, OK, I'm going to take at least four weeks to pull this off. And you're monitoring for withdrawal symptoms and also exacerbation of the underlying condition um, if it's coming back, for example. Um, so that's just a general rule of thumb. Um, I don't think you can ever go slow enough when you're stopping a medication. Um, but unfortunately, that takes a lot of time and monitoring. Um, and again, so you, you know, this is team medicine. Um, somebody could call and follow up. Um, you want to make sure the patient is educated on the parameters they're looking for in terms of their symptoms um, and that sort of thing. So this is a, a huge area that we need more work in, is how to de-prescribe. You're seeing a lot of this, too, um, in the literature as it relates to late in life. So does you know, someone with advanced dementia really need to be on a statin, for example? Um, so you'll, you're seeing a lot more of that. And I think there's really a paradigm shift. I just wanted to point out um, on a national level that the NIH, specifically the National Institute on Aging, and the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, um, currently have this massive trial underway to reduce falls in older adults. Um, it's $30 million, um, which is huge for this. This has never been done before a trial of this size. And they're looking at older adults who are at high risk for falls. Their goal is to get 6,000. Um, and they're really focusing on patient-centered strategies. Um, so over the next few years, keep your uh, eyes peeled, because you will see these trial results come out. And it will be really exciting to see if they have figured something out. In addition, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that um, I'm working on a grant right now from the CDC. And that is this grant here, which is to advance the primary care pharmacy linkage for medication review to reduce older adult falls. And really the rationalization for this by the CDC is that community pharmacists have this knowledge and they can really do a lot of good things, but they're not linked to primary care. And so oftentimes the interventions that community pharmacists make don't make it to the primary care office, and so therefore nothing is done. And so the goal here is to link them and to have the pharmacist review the med list of people that are on some of these high-risk meds to hopefully make a difference. Um, and so maybe next time uh, this year, I will come back and share you know, what that intervention might look like if we're so lucky to get the grant. So the key to falls, to geriatrics, 
to medications, to all of this, is a multidisciplinary approach is instrumental. Um, again, falling is a geriatric syndrome, so it takes many, many different approaches to solve these problems. Um, so I want everyone to think about um, what can you do to help prevent falls, to reduce fall risk, particularly as it relates to medications, since that's what we're talking about today, um, and how can you work with the other members of the healthcare team to really make a difference. So what are the remaining issues? Um, for me as a researcher, um, I think it's interesting to look at the differences in risk factors between falls and fractures, because not every fall leads to a fracture. So what are those risk factors that really lead to the most serious falls, which result in fractures? Um, if we better understand the mechanisms for medication-related falls, I think that information can be fed back in terms of drug development to hopefully develop safer drugs, um, maybe with less CNS side effects. I mentioned this one about the need for comparative effectiveness research. Um, because if you're a clinician and you have a patient with depression and you want to treat their depression, but they're also at high fall risk, you need we need better information for that clinician to help them select which antidepressant might be the safest um, for that individual patient. And then speaking to the PCORI grant, um, we really need feasible and scalable interventions to reduce medication-related falls and also the CDC grant. And then finally, I just wanted to mention vitamin D, um, which has been addressed at two of the previous lectures, if you've been to those. Um, Dr. Phelan addressed it, um, and also um, Dr. Lingtech, uh, Neander Chan, he addressed it. So what do we currently know? So Dr. Phelan talked about the American Geriatric Society consensus statement, and they recommend 1,000 units of vitamin D a day, um, plus calcium in older adults, and that's 65 and above. Um, the Institute of Medicine, their recommendations are for those 70 and above to take 800 international units a day. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of variability with vitamin D right now. It's kind of all over the place, but I think it's safe to say somewhere between 800 and 1,000. There's also um, a lot of variability in whether or not you should be checking levels. The Institute of Medicine says you don't really need to be checking levels. The AGS says only in those that are high risk for um, vitamin D deficiency. So these would be folks um, with obesity or some sort of malabsorption syndrome. Um, so that's kind of the general ballpark right now for vitamin D to prevent falls. I also wanted to um, complicate the picture a little bit and give you um, results of a, a study that just came out a couple weeks ago. It was in JAMA, um, and it was a clinical trial that was looking at the impact of vitamin D to prevent functional decline. Because I mentioned function is everything in geriatrics. And so if we can prevent functional decline, really that's, that's what we're striving for. And so they looked at three different doses of once a month super high dose vitamin D. So there was 24,000 international units once a month compared to 24,000 international units plus 300 milligrams of calcifediol, which is a metabolite of vitamin D. So you can just consider that a little bit higher dose. And then the third arm was 60,000 a month. So there were basically three different arms. And they did not find that vitamin D prevented functional decline. And paradoxically, they found that the two high-dose arms increase the risk of falling. And that's not the first study to show that. So for whatever reason, this once a month super high dosing seems to be um, a little bit risky in terms of falls. So it's actually causing falls. Um, it's unclear what the mechanism is for that. Um, but as with most vitamins, the story gets really, really complicated because people think that they can be used for everything. And then we study them, and, and the story becomes a little bit different. Um, but on a daily basis, I think 800 to 1,000 milligrams seems to be um, kind of where the evidence is currently at. So that is the vitamin D story. Stay tuned on that. And with that, I just wanted to leave you with a quote from um, one of the leaders in falls in older adults, Mary Tinetti. Um, and I think this kind of sums up <clears throat> what I talked about today. So if we can eliminate unnecessary meds, and reduce the dose of necessary meds, it's often possible to treat their coexisting conditions and minimize the risk of med-related injury. So that is the essence of the talk today. Hopefully that came across. Um, and at this point, I'd be happy uh, to take questions.
Okay, so some questions that are um, already on the chat. Um, any thoughts on the new SPRINT study that appears to support uh, tighter BP control for cardiovascular risk reduction even in the elderly? Some um, fall association, I think, only falls leading to emergency department visit study limitations. Do you know that study? Yeah, so I, unfortunately I didn't read the entire study, but I saw the abstract and the headline. And so I think, again, I think there's a paradigm shift um, because things have shifted in the past to say, oh, maybe we can get away with less tight blood pressure control. Um, it's basically the same story as the diabetes story. Um, and so I think now um, we're shifting back to maybe we need tighter control. Um, and so I guess the SPRINT study, it was a, a very strong study, um, and I think it, it just kind of complicated the picture a bit. Um, It'll be interesting to see how prescribers react. I think that in and of itself could be a study to see the impact <laughs> of the SPRINT study. Um, but I don't think it um, really is a definitive study. I don't think it'll change everybody's practice just yet. Um, and another question, is the STOP criteria helpful for deprescribing? De yes, that's a great question. So the STOP criteria, um, for those of you who don't know, the STOP criteria are the equivalent of the Beers criteria in Europe. And so they were developed by folks um, mostly from Ireland. And, um, you know, different countries have different drugs that are available and different um, ways to ascertain medications. And so it makes sense that they have different criteria. Um, and so, yes, the STOP criteria are useful for deprescribing. Um, you just want to consider the study setting. Um, they should typically be used in a European setting. Uh, Missoula is saying, I didn't see the urinary incontinence drugs on your list of anticholinergic agents. Yes, that's a great question. So um, the urinary incontinence drugs were included. I apologize, I, I didn't um, pull them out, but they were included in, in the list of anticholinergic drugs. Like I mentioned, anticholinergic drugs um, include a long list of medications. Um, but when you break it down by subclass, so the urinary incontinence is one class, um, the antihistamines, anti-vertigo, GI, antispasmodics. So those are all the different kind of subclasses. But yes, we, we looked at the UI uh, anticholinergic drugs. This is an interesting question. Is anyone doing studies on the effect of different exercise programs like yoga weights and the comparative effectiveness of those treatments, I'm assuming, to drugs? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I'm, of course, not an expert on, <clears throat> on these sort of interventions, but I used to work with some in Pittsburgh. And I do know that they are... Um, absolutely doing these studies. Um, it was a lot of PTs who were doing these studies, um, going to community-based um, housing um, in, in Pittsburgh, and they were looking at the impact of different exercise plans on reducing falls. Um, and I know at the Elder Friendly Futures Conference, there's a lot of that talk as well. Um, and so yes, a, a strong exercise and balance program is fundamental in fall prevention. And thoughts about comparing comparative effectiveness to medications? Yeah, so that's a great point. So how does that compare to medications? And um, unfortunately, it's really hard to disentangle the um, isolated effect of one component of an intervention because typically we throw the whole kitchen sink at, at these participants. and We, we hope that it works. Um, the CDC grant that I mentioned is interesting because they are asking for just a pharmacy intervention, which I was a little bit surprised by because typically the, the gold standard is multifactorial interventions for fall prevention. Um, so we don't know the comparative effectiveness um, just because it's, yeah, it's hard to disentangle. Can you speak to increased risk of stroke with higher doses of vitamin D um, that's coming from some recent media announcements? I am unfamiliar with that risk. Um, I can look okay. that up, but yeah, the most recent thing I saw was the article that I mentioned in JAMA that the once a month high dose increase the risk of falling, but I'm not aware of the stroke risk. And then Mazula says, I'm a social worker and want you to comment on what you said about how it's important to go slowly when taking older adults off antidepressants. You said it's impossible to go too slowly or something to that effect. Please comment on how you help support people who are depressed while the meds are being stopped um, or another antidepressant is being considered. What seems like a short time to medical providers can seem like a really long time to a depressed elder, that's a great point. Yeah, so that's a great point. Um, 
this is not easy. So the the stopping of these medications can these are some of the hardest medications to stop, which is the irony of it all, um, especially antidepressants. And so I think clear communication with the older adult is really important. Um, setting up expectations that these are the potential side effects that you could experience um, and what to do if those side effects occur. Um, and so laying out the plan um, and just kind of closely monitoring, I think, really goes a long way. Do we have questions here in the room? Do you want to give a preview of your talk coming up? Oh, sure, yeah. So um, I have been invited back to speak about medication adherence in older adults. Um, and it's a pretty big topic, um, but I will be talking about the measurement and different interventions that we could potentially consider um, to improve medication adherence, which is a huge public health issue. Um, because as C. Everett Koop uh, once said, drugs don't work in patients that don't take them. <laughs> so, But of course, we don't want people to be adherent to bad drugs. So yeah. that can cause them to fall. What is physiologically happening that causes more falls than those on SSRIs? That's a great question. So <clears throat> what is the mechanism of SSRI-related falls? It's not entirely clear, but it's thought to be due to sedation um, and confusion, basically. Um, there's a little bit of evidence to say that SSRIs have impacts, negative impacts on bones, um, but that hasn't really panned out in the literature. Um, that they could be kind of eating your bones a little bit and causing a little bit of osteoporosis. Um, but typically, the general consensus is that it is the impact on the brain and causing sedation. Can you comment on resources and looking for alternatives for medication that increase risk, substituting a different diuretic for Lasix, that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would recommend that everyone go check out the new beers criteria because for the first time ever they have published a list of alternative medications um, and so that is an excellent resource it's their first attempt at it so um, it will likely change and improve over the years but it is it's a great resource for alternatives because that was a big complaint of practitioners in the past is okay so you're telling me I can't use this but then what do I do so finally they are equipping um, practitioners with some alternatives. And suggestions on how to handle um, stopping drugs um, that put um, older adults at risk for falls like pain meds and sleepers because they may be resistant and not wanting to give them up. Yes. And so that is, yes, that is a very difficult problem. Um, I think this comes down to the communication of, you know, really spelling out what is the patient's risk for falls. And what does it mean to fall? And what are the bad outcomes with a fall? Um, and so shared decision making, I think, comes into play here, where you have a, a frank conversation about, you know, these are the risks and these are the benefits, um, and really getting the patient's values um, elicited from that conversation, I think, is really um, key here. But you're absolutely right. A lot of these meds, patients are wedded to. They may have been on them for years. Um, but it's important to, to educate patients to let them know that, okay, so a medication that you were on when you were 50 um, is much riskier now that you're 70 because your body has changed. And so really um, making sure the patient understands that um, I think can go a long way. Okay, I think we're done. All right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you all. And I just want to give a shout out to Anchorage um, and hope you're all safe from the earthquake. It hits hope to me because as many of you know, that's my hometown and I rode my house down the Turnigan Bluff in 64. So I thought about you a lot the other night um, when we heard about your earthquake and I hope you're all recovering and cleaned up now. Talk to you next week. Bye.